thanks for everyone for joining us today. This is an important topic, and so we're very pleased that so many of you have taken valuable time out of your day to join us. So what we want to do is kind of follow the, uh, the following topics uh, for our agenda today. First of all, just some important things for you to know. Um, you know, not, it doesn't all have to do with tax law changes themselves, but just important things that might have changed in the industry or just dates that you need to be aware of. We're going to talk about the 1040 redesign. There was a lot of discussion about it last year, and when the, when the laws changed, when legislation passed new tax law, at the beginning of the year, there was a redesign that was made for the 1040, and you need to know about that. We'll talk about tax changes with big impacts. We're going to talk about the things that really could be impacting your customer base and therefore you as you're working with them. We'll talk about expired provisions. We'll talk about the states and some of the impacts some of these changes are going to have on the states. And then we're going to finally finish with the Security Summit update. There's a Security Summit that takes place in, in, with regard to processing of, of uh, tax returns, especially electronically. And we want to make sure that you folks know the latest and greatest with regard to what's coming out of that summit. So with that, um, John said it's gonna take about a half an hour, maybe just a little bit less than that, but we do wanna make sure that there's an opportunity for you to ask questions afterwards. And that's why I'm joined by Mark Castro, who is our liaison with the IRS. And I believe between us, we should probably answer most of your questions, assuming that they're having to do with tax law updates. And as John said, if it's something that's just maybe a little bit off topic, we may pass that along to the salesperson to give you a call, or we may wait to the end so that it can be asked uh, so that everyone can get the answer to it. So let's go ahead and uh, jump right in, and we're going to start with some important things to know. And the first thing to understand is the Affordable Care Act. So one of the things that people might not understand is the penalty for not having health insurance. Uh, it still applies for 2018, and you're going to find that how you fill this out is going to be on what's known as Schedule 4, Line 61, which we're going to get into the schedules here in just a little bit. But one of the important things to understand is if a taxpayer did not have insurance for all or part of the year, they'll still need to complete a Form 8965 to claim an exemption or pay the penalty. There are some people that are in the misinterpretation that, you know what, that that went away. That may be going away next year, but that still is in effect for this year. The Affordable Care Act, and more specifically, the penalty for not having health insurance is still very much in play for this year. With regard to the start of the filing season, the IRS will announce a date, and they will do so later on in the month of December. However, one of the things we do know that it'll be most likely around the same time as last year, which would be the last Monday in the month of January. So we'll look for the official announcement to come out later this month, or excuse me, later next month in, in the month of December. But again, if it follows course, it should be around the 28th of January for the upcoming tax season. Other important things to know, delayed federal refunds. And we have went through this last year, and it's something to note again. The IRS will delay refunds for returns with earned income tax credit and or additional child tax credit until the 15th of February. Now, you've got to remember, that's the beginning of when they'll be processing those types of returns. The IRS is going to have messaging for delayed returns. So the messaging they're going to be sending out is that taxpayers can begin expecting to receive the refunds by the 27th of February. So again, if the 15th is the announced date that'll start, people should be able to receive their refund by the end of the month. On top of that, this will incur from now on, unless Congress does change the existing law that's in place. And we also should note that some people are interested in their state refunds. States are also delaying their refunds for identity theft reasons. So again, even as the filing season starts at the end of, of January, look for anything that has EITC or additional child tax credits to begin their process and funding on the 15th of February. Taxpayers' expectations. So I've just announced that, you know what, it's gonna be a later filing season start as we've seen has been the course here for the last couple of years. And then on top of that, if somebody has an earning income tax credit, a child tax credit, the coming that it's even going to be later than that. But we also have to realize that there's some taxpayer expectations that are going to be changing. Changes has happened, and this has to do with the laws of land and how they've changed this last year. So because there have been changes to exemptions, to standard deductions, and of course the limiting of those standard deductions, itemized deductions, and withholding calculations, what will happen is some taxpayers will actually be surprised by their tax return. And when I say surprise, it could very well be much less than they've been used to getting in the past. In fact, the IRS is concerned about this and they will be having some messaging 
that due to the aforementioned changes, individuals may not see the same results that they've seen in the past. And that you folks as the tax professional, as well as the software as company, shouldn't be blamed. There have been some changes made, and when people are getting a little bit more money on their paycheck, they might not be having as much being withheld. And because of that, it could have a dramatic impact on what their tax return is going to look like at the end of, or during this year, for the filing of last year. In fact, most taxpayers with EITC credits will be impacted. But, it, but it's very interesting to note that some may even see a larger refund due to the increase in the child tax credit. However, where this really can have an impact and people are getting less than they were getting before, taxpayers without EITC may see a lower refund or may even end up owing money. So as a tax professional, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you're educating your customers that these changes are coming. As far as paid prepared due diligence, this is another important thing to note, and that is, is that due diligence is added head of household filing status to the prepared due diligence requirements. Okay, so that's the first time. And the credit for other dependents was added to the requirements for the child tax credit. So there'll be other dependents and child tax credit we've seen on one line, which we're going to show you here in just a little bit. Changes to the Form 8867 as an outcome of this added, uh, this uh, head of household filing status being added. Some things of note. First of all, there'll be a checkbox for head of household added to part one, questions one through eight. So today you have your one through eight. There's actually going to be a column associated with head of household as well. And then there will also be a new part five added to the head of household filing status question. So those are going to be some slight changes that you can see on the due diligence checklist that you get on the 8867, and just be aware of the head of household has been added. Also of note, the $520 penalty for failure to comply, and I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard about the idea that you can be penalized if you're not complying with due diligence. One of the misconceptions that can be out there is that it actually relates to every credit that's claimed. And so if there are up to four claimed, credits claimed on a particular return, somebody could actually be dinged. You could actually be fined up to $2,080 per return. So this is not a $500, $520 penalty for being out of compliance as a practice but literally by return. The government is very serious with regard to due diligence. And one of the things we like to make sure we're sharing with everyone is that as an outcome of that, be sure that you're following your due diligence because the penalty is so severe. $520 penalty isn't for your practice as a whole or even for a return as a whole, but literally relates to every credit that's being claimed. Next up, we'd like to talk about the 1040 redesign. This is kind of interesting. There have been a lot of things that were made uh, with regard to the shortened form. So there are some things that we need to know. And first of all, a lot of people don't realize that because of the 1040 redesign, forms 1040A and 1040EZ have been completely eliminated. And that form 1040 remains two pages. Okay, so the 1040 form itself is two pages. However, the text will only take up half of each page. It's a very short form, so it's two pages long, but if you take the two together, it kind of equates to one page. What's that mean to you folks as tax professionals? Well, when we're using our software, the software companies, and Crosslink is no exception, will be allowed to print the two-page 1040 on a single page, which obviously is going to save a lot of paper for people who still choose to print uh, the, the returns. Now, of course, with Crosslink, we have the ability to go paperless, which is going to mean that in the archives themselves, it's going to be on a single page. But the reality of this whole thing is that the two-page 1040 document can be actually printed on a single page. On the two-page document itself, page one will include the filing status, taxpayer's spouse names and addresses, dependents, signature areas for the taxpayer's spouse and pay prepare, health care coverage, and a new checkbox for third-party designee. So that's what you would find on page one, which we're going to show here in just a moment. Page two will be a little bit more robust and that'll include your wages, the adjusted gross income, regular tax calculations on the 1040, non-refundable credits on the 1040, our tax child uh, credit and credit for other dependents, and then main refundable credits remain on the 1040 like BITC, additional child tax credit, and American Opportunity Education credit. And finally, other refundable credits found on Schedule 4. So all of this will be found on the second page. So continuing on with the 1040 design, there are going to be new schedules that support the shortened form. And that's what we were talking about before when you saw that Schedule 1. Just note that there'll be Schedule 1, which is additional income and adjustments to income, 
Schedule two will be for tax. In other words, the alternative minimum tax is excess advanced premium tax credit. Schedule three will be for non-refundable credits. Schedule four will be for other taxes. Schedule five for other payments and refundable credits. And finally, schedule six will be for foreign address or third-party designee information. So all of those will be schedules that now support the new 1040 or shortened 1040 form. Now, with regard to child tax credit, we're talking about big impact changes that are happening at this particular time. And we'll start with child tax credit. With regard to the child tax credit, this is brand new. Eligible children must have a valid social security number to qualify for child tax credit. For people that have an ITIN instead, they will qualify for the new credit for other dependents. The credit has been increased to $2,000 for each child, of which $1,400 is eligible to be refundable. And the age qualification remains unchanged in that it'll be for the ages under 17. Now the child tax credit and credit for other dependents, which we just talked about on the previous slide, please note that both credits are included on one line on the 1040. That will be on line 12, and this is what it's going to look like. And for you as the tax professional, details on how to both credits are calculated can be found on a worksheet within the 1040 instructions. Finally, with regard to standard deductions, it is important to note that they will be $12,000 for single this year, $24,000 for married filing jointly, and $18,000 for head of household. Next up, we want to talk about exemptions, and these will have big impacts as well. They were suspended beginning in tax year 2018, which means that the boxes for exemptions and the exemption line have been removed from the Form 1040. And the impact for single or married taxpayers with more than one child or head of household filers with more than two children, it will mean that they'll lose the $4,150 credit for each additional child, which means their taxable income will be higher. For lower income taxpayers, the child tax credit should more than offset that exemption deduction, unless, of course, they have a lot of children. Another big impact changes have to do with itemized deductions, in other words, the Schedule A. With regard to that, first of all, medical deductions, the, the uh, adjusted gross income threshold will be 7.5% for the tax year 2018 and 10% for tax year 2019 and beyond. On top of that, taxes the limits of $10,000 total. So in other words, as far as itemized deductions for taxes, there'll be a $10,000 limit, and that will be for everything, for state, for local, for local income tax, and real estate taxes. On top of that, miscellaneous itemized deductions associated with the 2% of, of adjusted gross income will no longer be allowed. And this includes employee business expenses that were included on Form 2106. When it comes to mortgage interest, and this is going to be very interesting because this is a big change, only interest on the home mortgage of the individual's principal residence will be deductible. And on top of that, if somebody has a second or a home equity line or a home equity loan, that will be no longer deductible unless it is used specifically to improve the principal residence. When it comes to casualty loss, only losses deemed a presidentially or declared by presidential declaration disaster areas can be claimed, and this must include, when you're doing a casualty loss, it must include the FEMA disaster declaration number on Form 4684 in order to claim a casualty loss. Other big, pack in cha uh, big impact changes, the 20% deduction for qualified business income. For the tax years 2018 through 2025, an individual may be able to deduct 20% of their domestic qualified business income from partnerships, S corporations or sole proprietorship. So if an individual's taxable income is below $157,500 or $315,000 for joint filers, the individual may take a deduction for the lesser of the following, 20% of the income from their business or 20% of their taxable income, excluding any capital gains. When it comes to moving expenses, one of the things to note, only members of the military are allowed to deduct moving expenses as an adjustment to income. And again, note that entertainment expenses are no longer deductible. Those are some big impact changes that are coming for this next year that will change many of the types of things that people are going to be able to make claims on.
Now, let's take a look at expired federal provisions. The provisions extended in February 2018 were actually only for one year, for another words, the tax season of 2017. So of note, Congress has stated that they want to pass extended legislation again. However, we haven't seen that happen, and it could happen in January, it could happen in February. I don't believe it'll happen in December, but I can never say never on something like that, okay? Individual expired provisions with the greatest impact. These are pretty big time. First of all, tuition and fees deduction, which is form 8917. Exclusion of gain from income of foreclosed home mortgage debt, which is form 982 line 1E. And then treating mortgage interest premiums as qualified mortgage interest on a Schedule A. And there may also be legislation that's passed, and this is not uncommon, we've seen this in the past, in short order pertaining to provisions related to the hurricanes and or wildfires. We had some pretty serious devastation during the latter part of this last year, and we could see some legislation passed with it providing some relief in both those instances. Next up, we want to talk about states. Why are states so important? Because some of the changes that were made to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that was the legislation that was passed at the beginning of last year, had a profound impact on how the states are going to interact with the federal returns as well. So states with additional legislation, take a look at this list. On top of that, states that are not completely conforming. And finally, states that are in full conformity. Why is it that we're kind of mentioning all this type of stuff? Well, take a look at this. The impact is the following. The previous slide that I just showed you illustrates just how much change is occurring at the state level. And only about 10 states will have little or no change. So it's going to have a profound impact, and you're going to really have to moderate that closely as a tax professional, what those changes will mean to your taxpayers in particular states. Over 30 states will have at least some changes driven by this new legislation. And some state changes of note already we know about. There are four states that have increased their EITC percentage, a federal EITC, so as you have Louisiana, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Vermont. On top of that, California and Maryland have expanded access to EITC. Idaho has added a child tax credit, and states that take a percentage of federal child tax credit may not include the credit for other dependents. Other things of note, the effect of changes to itemized deductions. Think about this for just a moment. States may allow, they may, because each one will make its own determinations, they may allow the taxpayer to itemize even standard, even if standard deduction is used on the federal return. So if you take the standard deductions because so much higher on the federal return, the state still may allow itemization to take place. On top of that, states may still follow Form 2106 business expenses as an itemized deduction. And what will that mean? They will have to create their own state version of the Form 2106. So in many instances, the states are going to have to create forms that were at one time um, very similar to the federal forms. But if the federal forms aren't, aren't the same anymore because of legislation changes and they want to do that, they're going to have to create their own forms. Same hold true with states that may allow itemized deductions that are no longer applicable on the federal return. They, too, may have to create their own state version of a Schedule A. And states that add back state income taxes will have to take a ratio if the taxes are limited on the federal Schedule A and they have both a state income tax as well as property taxes. What I'd like to finish up with today is the, e, uh, is the security summit update. And security summit updates, as I said before, is literally uh, the, the folks come together, especially when it comes to electronic filing and, and software companies, and they really want to make sure that people understand how serious some of the, the situations are with regard to people hacking in to people's databases. And so the first thing we want to talk about is ETHIN validation. When it comes to ETHIN validation, there will be no change from last year. That's the first thing that you should know. If you have received a tracking number, it should be provided during the bank enrollment. This will be a good practice since the IRS tracking may take place as early as next year. And we start talking about tracking. The IRS is diligently looking at this, but if they begin to seriously start tracking ETHIN validation, that it's one of those things that you're going to want to make sure that you've already kind of in incorporated into your practice. On top of that, when it comes to security and tax preparation, the IRS continues to emphasize the need, not just the want, but the absolute need for preparers to take data and system security seriously. 
In the first two months of last year, they did an audit and found that over 350 preparers actually had their databases breached. So there are some action items that the IRS, as well as states, are requiring software companies to implement. So what that include? When installing tax software, users will be shown information on how to protect themselves from identity thieves and hackers. On top of that, states will begin requiring software companies to force subscribers to install updates within 10 days of a release. So if you're if you're if we're getting you for sending you updates, you are going to be asked to make sure that those updates are installed within 10 days of when we send them out to you. And on top of that, a two-factor authentication for online accounts is certainly going to be encouraged by the IRS as far as well as the Security Summit Group. Using only text or email has really become a, an issue. It's really a problem. So for this year, software companies are going to be looking to have subscribers volunteer to use two different methods to complete the two-factor um, authentication. So with that, that kind of brings me to the end of the initial uh, presentation that I have. However, before I open it up for questions, which John, is, John will be helping us out with and Mark Castro will be here to help us out as well, one of the things I want to do is make sure that everyone on this call is aware that if you go to our website at any time, you will go into our customer resources. Certainly the Tax Resource Center is a wonderful place to get further information on all the different things that we not only talked about today, but as tax law changes, as there's changes in the industry and how it impacts you folks, please use this valuable resource. Again, going to our website, simply going to customer resources and going to the Tax Resource Center, we continually look at updating this information so that it is very, very relevant to you folks as our tax professional partners. But I'd like to, at this point, turn it over to John to see if there are any questions that you folks might have for today's presentation. Thank John? you, Steve. And, and as Steve, uh, thank you very much, Steve. And as Steve mentioned, uh, there's a lot of information on our website regarding the latest uh, in regards to tax law changes. And virtually every update that's on there, we also post for our social media channels. And that's why we encourage you to join the conversation so that you can get that information real time as you're checking your Twitter feed or your Facebook page or any of the other information out there. I would also like to extend an apology. I, you know, sometimes technology gets away from us a little bit. I understand there was a lot of background noise today. Um, and uh, it looks like through GoToWebinar, we might have had some lines crossed. So our apologies for that. Um, but that said, um, I, I think uh, most, if not all of you, were able to hear the uh, presentation. And with that, we've got some questions that are coming in that we would like to share. <clears throat> One of the questions, someone is looking for clarification. Um, is the interest, can the interest on a rental property, um, it, it can no longer be deducted, is that correct? Yeah, rental property, if you're taking it on Schedule E, that's still deductible. It's um, only if you have a like a second home, vacation home, um, before you were able to take an itemized deduction on that on mortgage interest expense, now you cannot do that. But for rentals, if you're taking, you're, you're reporting that on Schedule E for rental, rental properties, you can still take the um, interest on that. Is that answer? Okay, hopefully Excellent. that answers. Well done question. If it doesn't, uh, or if you have further follow-up questions, please type it in. We'll go ahead and, and do that. The next question that comes in, will the taxpayer be able to claim their dependents even if they were unemployed for the previous tax year? Thank you. Hold on. Um, well, if they qualify as a dependent, other dependent, it depends on what their age is. So the tax if, if the dependent is a child still, which means that they are under 17, that takes child tax credit. Um, if they are um, if they are 17, 18, or a student, then they can still take the um, other dependent credit. So I'm not quite sure if that's what they're asking. Is that that answer your question? It was, it was specific to if they were unemployed in the prior year. If they're unemployed in the prior year and they weren't a child, um, they still have to meet the um, income um, level um, requirements, which is if they have income over 4150, then they can't be claimed as a dependent. If they have income under 4150, they have zero income, then they can be claimed as an other dependent. 
Okay. Um, next question. Does the 500 tax credit for non-child dependent, um, let, me, let me read this again. I'm, I'm, it, does the 500 tax credit for non-child dependent, is it valid for individuals living in Mexico or Canada? I'm not sure the answer to that. We'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Um, once again, um, just a reminder, and Steve, maybe you can touch on this with the EFIN validation, uh, just a real high level, what is it and why is it important? Well, actually, uh, Mark can answer this as well as I. It's very interesting, though. The EFIN validation is something that's coming. It really is. And the tracking is already beginning to start. It's just that uh, noncompliance is not necessarily something that's going to stop somebody from being able to file. But Mark, why don't you give us a little bit of background from uh, from uh, the government's perspective of why we're doing EFIN validation? Okay, the EFIN validation, the reason companies are doing that is because software companies are required by the IRS to validate that the EFINs that we are using from our EROs of our customers are valid and belong to that ERO. So in order to do that, um, we are sending um, information on our EROs that we have to the IRS, and the IRS confirms that yes, that's a valid EFIN. Um, so that's the reason why we're doing that um, all, and um, right now. So does that answer it? I'm sorry, Mark. I, I can't so. answer whether that answers it or not because I, I have to wait for <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's um, basically what we're doing. If anybody has any more questions on that, just uh, let us know. We can try to answer it more clearly if it wasn't clear. All right. And then this question has come up a couple times just to make it easy for everyone. Um, in regards to today's presentation, we will have a recording that will be pay, uh, posted to our YouTube account. So pay attention to that. Again, if you subscribe to YouTube, uh, one more pitch on social media. When we post a new video there, you will receive a notification. And that applies not just for this presentation today, but all of our webinars uh, moving forward through the season. Um, all right, uh, Mark, uh, I think this one's going to be directed to you, which is, are there any changes to the upcoming tax season for Form 982 or cancellation of debt from a foreclosure property? Uh, right now, that's, that's, that expired at the end of 2017. Um, in order for that to still apply, 2018, Congress would have to pass and extend that provision. Right now, Congress may it wants to pass the extended the the, um, the provisions that expired, which that is one of them. But we have to wait and see. That's what we talked about before in the extender legislation. Um, either there is a bill out there now for that, which would either pass um, during the um, session of in progress right now or early next year. So we just have to wait and see um, if that passes or not. So for right now, it doesn't apply unless they pass legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so a, a follow-up to the Canada-Mexico question. Uh, dependents, uh, so, so the clarification is dependents who live in Mexico and Canada that the taxpayer supports at least 50%, do they qualify for the $500 credit? Again, I'm not absolutely positive. I have to look that up. I'm not sure. Okay. Sounds good. Um, all right. So let me get down here. we got quite a few questions coming in. Um, do you, off the top of your head, happen to know what the amount is for the new itemized total for a single individual? I mean the limitation. Um, there is no limitation anymore. When higher income taxpayers in the past they had their itemized deductions limited. That that went away on the on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, to itemize now you have to be able to new standard deductions amounts, which basically doubles for for singles and, and married. Okay. Um, question is: Are there any questions being added to the 8867? Uh, for due diligence purposes. Yeah, the new the new questions are asking is from questions one through eight, that section which applies to the, all the credits 
And now they had a household. They added a box for the head of household for all questions one through eight. And they added a new section for um, head of household. There's one question asked specifically for head of household. The new $500 credit for other credit for other dependents that folds into the child tax credit um, provisions. Okay. Excellent. All right. If you have any other questions, now is the time to answer them. I'm just reviewing really quick to see if we have missed any. There are quite a few that came in. Um, question in regards to our software. When will Crosslink 1040 desktop? Keep in mind, I'm speaking specifically about the desktop product. When will that be available? I'm happy to report that that will be available early next week. So if you keep a, uh, an eye on our social media channels, we will notify you when it's available on those channels. In addition, uh, you will receive an email notifying you if you're a, a current customer of when the software is available. So that should be out early next week. And then um, in regards to uh, a follow-up question to that is, will um, the tax laws be represented in um, our latest download of the software? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Uh, we will be uh, doing that. Um, uh, hey, John. What? Hey, John. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If I could add one other piece of information that, that, that that's very, very important to understand that the, the program's coming out next week, and of course, it will incorporate the new 1040 design and all the tax law changes. Do note, if you go into uh, our resources, and you're looking at webcast to sign up for. We did this webcast very early on. Um, Mark and I sat down and said, this is of great value to people and they want this information even before the software comes out. We will be doing this same webcast. And when I say same, to the great extent, it'll be the same during the very first week in January. But some of the things may change because by then we will probably note the date that the, the filing season will start. Some of the things that might occur in December, including declarations of, of, uh, of uh, damaged areas such as wildfires and hurricanes if legislation passes those types of things or extenders, some, sometimes extenders happen. So please don't hesitate to have your folks listen in on that second webcast. Mark, uh, John said uh, that this one will be posted and it will be, but there could be some changes between the now and the one that we do at the beginning of January. And that's just an FYI that we do one early because we wanna get this information to you. It's so important. But some things are kind of in flux and they are changing somewhat. And because of that, we'll be doing a second one at the very beginning of 2019. Excellent. And also, Steve, I also I just want to point out that these are the most um, impactful changes. The full uh, full changes, including the depreciation changes and others, are on the um, the Crosslink website, the Tax Resource Center. So if you want to get a full view of what's changed, uh, go there and you can see those changes. Excellent. Good point. Um, all right. I got another question uh, for you. I got a couple more questions coming your way. This, Mark, I think this is specific to you. Um, I'm just read it verbatim here, which is when I went to conference, they said that if an employee is a reimbursed employee, like a plant worker who goes uh, state to state that they would still be able to deduct their expenses. Um, where will this go now that there is no 2106? Um, that I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to I'd have to do research to tell you that. Okay. Well, yeah. We'll actually, follow. actually, where that will go, John, will probably be determined when the new software comes out as well. Fair enough. That's correct. Fair enough. Um, you know, one of the questions has uh, become, will we be able to, and Steve, I'll let you expand upon this, uh, on our YouTube channel, which, by the way, um, we have quite a bit of information on there, um, dozens and dozens of videos um, on using the software and filling out forms and things like that. Um, one of the questions that comes up is, will we be posting a video on how to fill out the new 1040 form? I, I don't believe the answer to that is yes. I, I, I don't think we will be doing that. But, Steve, I will let you expand upon that. Um, if you'd like to. I'd be more than happy to. It, the reality of this is that the new program is coming out to what John said next week. And we are going to be doing some webcasts here over the course of the next month. And what they're going to do is they're going to include navigating through a 1040. So we'll be using the new form when we're doing those, those particular webcasts. 
So I'm excited to say that we will give you the latest and greatest if you just attend our webcast or look for those recordings after they're done. So starting, I believe it is next week or the week following, we're going to start. And please, you can take a look at the calendar, uh, the schedule of uh, web webcast, literally on the on the Crosslink homepage. And with regard to that, whenever we're doing something like navigating at 1040, we will be using the new shortened form because that's what will be relevant at that time. Because again, the new program comes out next week. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, in regards mm -hmm. to paperless returns, uh, the, the question being asked here in regards to paperless returns is if they are required to give the customer a hard copy of the return, um, are there any requirements in terms of what the taxpayer is supposed to leave the office with? It would be no different than in the past. You just would receive the 1040 and any schedules that um, are associated with it. The new schedules, Schedule 1 through 6, if they apply, plus whatever other subsidiary forms that um, that make up the return. It hasn't really changed from what it was in the past. It's whatever whatever is um, whatever is, is created by the return, that's what they should be getting a copy of. Okay. And, um, and then... Um, I, I think specifically, Mark, what they're asking was, is it requir a requirement for them to provide a hard copy of it, or is it um, acceptable for them to send them an electronic copy? Either one, as long as they get a copy of the return. It can be hard copy or it can be um, a PDF if, if, they, if they want that. Of course, if they send it by email, it needs to be encrypted. It just should not send returns unencrypted over the email. And as you well know, John, the, our, our software supports all of those things. The encryption, exactly. the idea that you can send an email. So it's a perfect, uh, kind of a perfect lead into the idea that if you want to go paperless, you can still make sure that you're very much in compliance and you just will need to make sure that you're set up so that a uh, copy goes in the document archive. And if you're sending an email copy that it's encrypted, which again, our software will take care for you. Yeah, and a little, a little bit follow up from a marketing perspective on that is that's one of the things we pride ourselves on is we were one of the first um, in the industry to enable a fully paperless office. So we absolutely support um, support that um, on all fronts. If you have any questions, be sure to talk to your salesperson. Um, there's been a couple questions about other products online, et cetera. What I would encourage each of you to do on that front is to contact your, your Crosslink salesperson um, directly, and they will be able to walk through the solutions that we have that are appropriate for your business. Um, but on a call like this, it's, it's kind of difficult for me to guess as to whether certain products are the the right solution for you or your business. Um, okay, um, Mark, we're just going to do a couple more. There's still some more questions coming in, and folks, you are welcome to continue to submit them. We might have to respond to a few of them by email so that we can wrap up the call. But I, I will take a couple more here. Uh, Mark, if the taxpayer and the dependents have eaten, can they still claim the new credit for other dependents? Yeah, for items for children under 17 that have an item, they can change. They can they can still claim the non-refundable new um, $500 credit for other dependents. So they fall under that um, that category. And there is a new checkbox on the 1040. You'll see for the dependents line. There's a checkbox for for EIT. EITC, and there's a checkbox for the uh, child tax credit, and there's one for the other dependents credit. Okay. Um, let's see. Are there any changes in regards to Schedule C for the upcoming season that they should be aware of? The only change to Schedule C is you cannot take entertainment expenses. Okay. And then, of course, the depreciation changes, which um, which are detailed in the um, you know, the bonus depreciation and other things that so that applies in the but otherwise the schedule C itself only the only change, real change is that you cannot take an attainment expense. Okay. I, I think this is gonna be the last question we address on today's call, which is we were uh it, it, it I'm gonna read it as as it's as it's posted, which is at conference they were told that the interest of the second home would be deductible. Um and uh, they want to verify whether this is correct or if we're stating otherwise. Well, the only mortgage interest that the 
Residence and Lease and um, Executive on Schedule A is mortgage interest is for the principal residence only. Any other second home or a vacation home, it's no longer deductible. All right, with that, if you have any additional questions, what I would encourage everybody to do is first, check out the tax resources page that we um, have referenced a couple of times. Steve, you might be able to bring that up one more time uh, to show them. And if your answer is not located on our tax resource page on crosslinktax.com, um, I recommend that you reach out to your Crosslink um, uh, sales representative and they can get a hold of Mark and get your questions answered for you if you have questions on the, any of these topics. So with that, um, again, we know your time is extremely valuable. I know we went a little long, but I feel like we got some good questions from you here. and We did our best to answer uh, most, if not all of them. Uh, with that, thank you very much for joining today's call. Steve, uh, Mark, thank you very much for the presentation today.